On the evening of November 28, 2009, Michelle Davidson called 911 and told the operator that there was an unknown man loitering in his vehicle on the street, and she believed that he was casing out the area in order to commit a crime. It's likely that Michelle was concerned about burglary in the neighborhood and thought that a patrol car driving through the area would scare away any potential thieves. Little did she know that the man in the vehicle was mere minutes away from committing a mass murder. This is Monsters. In the summer of 2008, James Craig Kaler was offered a new job in Missouri. He was already known as a successful man, working as the Director of Public Utilities in Texas, but this new job in Columbia, Missouri would allow him to climb even higher on the civil ladder. The people that knew James agreed that he was a man with strong family values, who was very proud of his wife and children. Making sure that he was making the right decisions for them was his top priority. At the time, the couple had three children, two teenage girls, Emily and Lauren, as well as their son, Sean, who was the youngest. On the surface, the Kaler family was perfect. Both James and his wife, Karen, had successful careers and were highly involved in their community. They had a strong relationship, taking regular vacations, just the two of them, to keep their romance alive, but they also prioritized spending quality time with their children. In his spare time, James liked to make his own jewelry and he'd often give pieces to Karen as gifts. Of course, things aren't always what they seem on the surface. Karen told her sister, Lynn Denton, that James had become extremely controlling, giving her an allowance, a curfew, setting timers for her to get things done within an allotted amount of time, and demanding they have sex every day at 8 p.m. He demanded to know about her every move. After having two daughters, James had been thrilled when their youngest child, Sean, was born. Karen hadn't wanted to have any more children, but James had insisted that he wanted a large family with six or seven children and, in particular, he wanted a son. Eventually, Karen relented and wrote a contract stating that she was willing to have one more child, but after that pregnancy, she would get her tubes tied. Instead, James had a vasectomy after Sean was born. To him, Sean completed his life. He felt like he could do more with Sean, taking him out hunting and fishing whenever he got the chance, and going on outings to see NASCAR races. Those were hobbies that James had loved all his life, and he was excited to get the chance to share them with his child. Though, to be fair, you can absolutely share your interests with all of your children, no matter what their gender is. Can you tell me there are no women who are NASCAR fans? When James told Karen about the job offer, she agreed that they would relocate their family from their current home in Weatherford, Texas. To make the change easier on the kids, James and Karen decided that she would stay behind in Texas for a few months while James got started at the new job. And once he was settled in, Karen and the children would move in early fall. Before James moved away, Karen sat him down for another conversation, telling him that she was interested in experimenting sexually during their time apart. Later, James described the conversation as the moment when Karen made the decision to quote-unquote become homosexual. Karen worked as a fitness trainer at a nearby gym, and she had realized that she was attracted to one of her female co-workers, a personal trainer named Sonny Reese. She reassured James that, while she wanted to experiment with Sonny, as her husband, he would always be number one. James quickly gave Karen permission to begin a sexual relationship with her co-worker, assuming that it would be a short-lived affair that would only last until Karen moved to Missouri to be with him. Of course, before that, he used the opportunity to ask Sonny if they could have a threesome. Deep down, James wasn't as confident about the decision as Karen thought he was. He personally knew several couples who had gone through infidelity leading to their previously happy marriage being destroyed. One of the other men in his fishing group, a man he had previously looked up to, had cheated on his wife and left his family to be with her, abandoning his two young sons. Hearing that story had shaken James and he didn't want the same thing to happen to his family. 
James tried to reassure himself, thinking that Karen was just going through a midlife crisis. He didn't have the time to worry about Karen falling for another woman. He was already stressed about his new job and the effort of relocating his family to a different state. Karen quickly became infatuated with Sonny, and even after she relocated to Missouri to be with James, she kept talking to her new partner. She also made several trips to visit Sonny, and on one occasion, Sonny booked a flight to Columbia to spend a few days with Karen. James still didn't feel threatened. Sonny had no plans to move to Columbia permanently, and he felt as if his sex life to Karen hadn't been affected by her affair. After Christmas of 2008, the Kalers were invited to a New Year's party back in Weatherford, which they attended, and so did Karen's lover. The party was held at the home of Dan and Marianna Coulter, who had been the Kaler's neighbor when they had lived in Weatherford. At first, James had been excited for the party because he missed his community in Texas. But as the night went on, he realized that Karen's relationship with Sonny was much more intense than he'd originally believed. Throughout the night, James became more and more infuriated about the way that Karen was behaving around the other woman. He would later say, quote, they were making fools of themselves, making a spectacle of themselves in front of the neighbors. He felt that it was embarrassing and that he was being humiliated in front of the other party guests. A couple of his old friends even asked what was going on between Karen and Sonny. James decided to confront Karen, asking her to come speak with him outside so that nobody could listen in on the conversation. Karen began to argue back and James became so angry that he shoved Karen away from him. He assumed that she would keep control of herself in an environment where everybody expected her to behave like a wife and mother, and he felt that she had lied to his face and publicly disrespected him. After he pushed Karen, she fell, hitting her head on the ground. She got up and returned to the party, but the other guests noticed that she seemed subdued and distant. On New Year's Day, James went out fishing with Sean as well as his friend Barry Goodwin and Barry's two children. During the outing, Barry tried to talk to James about Karen and Sonny's behavior at the party, but James shut the conversation topic down. He told Barry that he was a public-facing professional and that he couldn't afford gossip. Later that day, James gave Karen an ultimatum. She had to choose between him and Sonny. He told her that he had agreed to allow her to sexually experiment, but he hadn't wanted her to engage in a full-blown love affair with another woman. He typed out a message to Sonny telling her that Karen didn't love her and that the affair between the two of them needed to end for the good of the kids. Karen agreed to contact Sonny telling her that the relationship was causing her trouble and that it needed to end. It was clear to James and Karen that their marriage was falling apart. In mid-January of 2009, they decided to see a marriage counselor but didn't find it helpful. It was clear from the counseling session that James wanted to work things out, offering to take Karen on family trips across the United States, but that Karen had emotionally checked out of the relationship. By late January, Karen could no longer see a future with her husband at all, and she told him that she wanted a divorce. James didn't believe that she was serious and tried to get her to come to her senses. In his eyes, there was still a relationship to salvage. Their acquaintances had previously told the callers that they were the perfect family, which James was extremely proud of. He believed that Karen was a good mother to their children, and he felt that he'd done a good job taking care of her with his stable career. Thinking that she was making an irrational decision, James began to consider that she was suffering from some sort of hormonal imbalance or beginning to go through menopause. After January 28, 2009, James and Karen were sleeping in different beds, barely speaking to each other. But James didn't trust Karen, and he wanted to monitor her as closely as possible, so he regularly used a key logging tool to see who she was talking to and what she was doing. Definitely a sign of a salvageable marriage. The key logger tracked every keystroke that Karen made on her phone or computer. James was reading her emails, looking at her phone calls, and keeping track of every detail of her bank account and credit card charges. The impending divorce was devastating for James. He wasn't just faced with the reality of losing his wife and family. His behavior towards Karen during their separation also resulted in his professional reputation being destroyed. At first, Karen and the children were still living with James in Missouri. 
Two months later, after Karen went to the police and made a battery complaint against James, he was arrested by three police officers while he was working at a city council meeting on March 26th. The following day, James returned to work, and the city never suspended him from his job, but the city manager, Bill Watkins, told the media that they planned to closely monitor the situation. News of the incident quickly spread through the area after an article appeared in the Columbia Daily Tribune on March 28th titled, City Utilities Director Charged with Misdemeanor Assault. The article discussed the contents of Karen's court order for protection against her husband. The assault had taken place when Karen tried to discuss filing for divorce and James responded by physically blocking the doorway of the room to prevent her from leaving and held her in place in what Karen described as a bear hug that caused several bruises and scrapes to her body. In the court order, Karen also described James as being a controlling man who was capable of using force against her. Within a few weeks of the incident, Karen decided that she needed to move out, taking the children with her. Suddenly, James was living in an almost empty 4,300 square foot or 400 square meter mansion. Everything that had belonged to Karen, Emily, Lauren, and Sean was gone. From the day their separation began, James only saw his children very occasionally when Karen would bring them over to the house. He wasn't invited to celebrate Emily or Lauren's 18th and 16th birthday parties, and he even missed out on Sean's 10th birthday. While James felt he still had a good relationship with Sean, he noticed his relationship with Emily and Lauren disintegrating. He believed that that was Karen's fault, assuming that she'd been saying things to make his daughters turn against him. On one occasion, Lauren allegedly told her father to just, quote, get a whore and get over it. Sonny and Karen were still seeing each other and James also blamed Sonny for playing a part in corrupting his family. Karen was determined to move on with her life and kept things as normal as possible for her daughters. Now that Emily was 18 and about to attend college, she needed a car, so Karen bought an old car from Sonny's parents and gave it to Emily as a gift. Emily wanted to study pharmacy in St. Louis, and instead of sending her to the less expensive University of Missouri, Karen took out $20,000 of her and James's retirement funds to help pay for the tuition. Financially, James was kept distant from the family, with Karen paying the bills and handling their checkbooks. James's colleagues noticed an immediate change in his demeanor and performance at work. He had previously been a diligent man who paid attention to every detail, but now he was constantly distracted by his own personal problems and didn't seem capable of focusing on any task. James later insisted that his performance had been fine and that he had even been making an effort to work overtime every day. Even with time and distance away from Karen, James continued to underperform at work and finally, in August of 2009, the city terminated his employment. James's parents were concerned about how their son was coping. He was isolated in a new city and he had just lost his wife, his children, and his job. They made the drive to Columbia and picked James up, taking him back home to the ranch they owned in Meriden, Kansas. James struggled with not having the routine and purpose of a job, but he didn't want to return to work before his divorce was finalized, as that would mean giving more of his money to Karen. Deep down, he also didn't believe that his life would be able to go back to normal. He had lost the best job he'd ever had, and he felt that his public arrest overshadowed the professional reputation that he had worked so hard to build. Instead of going back to work, he made an inquiry about unemployment and spent his time hunting elk with his father. During the separation from his family, James had gone from thinking that Karen had turned his daughters against him to resenting Emily and Lauren almost as much as he resented Karen and Sonny. He had seen a post on Lauren's Facebook where she had stated she was bisexual, which infuriated him. To James, the perfect family, which he had spent 25 years working to build, was now in shreds. He had heard that Karen and Sonny were sleeping in the same room while the children were in the house, which he believed was inappropriate. Shortly after Karen moved out, James had contacted Karen's family about her affair, hoping that they would take his side, but instead, Karen's family had welcomed Sonny with open arms, even inviting her to stay with them over Halloween. Sonny and Karen had spent time visiting Karen's sister in Wichita with the kids, as well as Karen's widowed grandmother, Dorothy White. James couldn't believe that Dorothy would accept Sonny into the family and insisted that if Dorothy's husband George was still alive, he would never have accepted a homosexual affair. 
James was also struggling with how his reality lined up with his Catholic beliefs. His wife was dating another woman, one of his daughters was bisexual, and getting divorced went against his faith. He began to feel more and more disillusioned with the church, wondering why God didn't intervene to help people who were sick and dying. Throughout all of that, his relationship with Sean was his guiding light. He felt as if Sean would be happier living with him on the ranch, where they could go fishing and hunting and live in the moment. Karen began to worry that James would abduct Sean, but he insisted that he would never do that to his own son. During Thanksgiving that year, James was reunited with one member of his family. Sean would end up spending the holiday at the ranch with James. However, James's other two children didn't come with him. Emily and Lauren went to stay with their mother at their aunt's house. Because their aunt also lived in Kansas, the family planned to uphold their annual tradition. Every year, the Kalers would go to Karen's grandmother's house for the weekend after Thanksgiving. Karen's grandmother was 89-year-old Dorothy White, who lived nearby in Burlingame. But this year, James was no longer invited. The holiday was already bittersweet. Karen and James were due to appear in court to decide who would have custody of the children. Karen had planned to pick Sean up on November 28th and then drive him straight to Dorothy's house where he'd stay for the weekend. But on that Saturday morning, Sean wasn't ready to leave the ranch. He had spent the past few days going fishing and hunting with his father and he decided to call his mother and ask if he could stay at the ranch that weekend instead of going to his great-grandmother's house. Allegedly, Karen felt that James had spent enough time with his son and insisted that she would come to pick him up. While James was out doing some shopping, his mother drove Sean from Meriden to Topeka, where Karen picked him up and took him to Dorothy's house to be reunited with his sisters. Early that evening, a 911 call came through from one of Dorothy's neighbors. Michelle Davidson told the operator that there was an unknown man loitering in his vehicle on the street, and she believed that he was casing out the area in order to commit a crime. Michelle and her partner, Trevor Gibson, had started watching the vehicle, which they described as being a noisy, bright red Ford Explorer, the same color make and model driven by James. About a half an hour later, James got out of his vehicle and entered Dorothy's house through the back door. He walked into the kitchen, where he saw Karen standing with Sean. Aiming his gun at Karen, James shot his estranged wife twice in quick succession but made no attempt to shoot his son. Leaving Sean standing in the kitchen with Karen seriously wounded on the floor, James went looking for the rest of his family. As soon as James was out of sight, Sean ran away through the back door. At first, he tried to go around to the front of the house, hoping that he could run back inside and use the phone to call the police. But when he saw James walk past again, still holding his gun, he decided that it wasn't safe. Sean quietly closed the door and then heard two more gunshots. He ran to the neighbors and knocked on the door, but there was nobody home. Finally, he ran to another house in the neighborhood where he could see the lights on and managed to tell the occupants that they needed to call the police, quote, because there had been a shooting across the street at Dorothy White's house. Sean was terrified, but after calming down, he told the neighbors that his father had been the shooter and that he believed his mother, sisters, and great-grandmother had all been shot. Almost simultaneously, a second 911 call was placed. That one was an automatic call through Dorothy's life alert system, which had detected that the elderly woman needed emergency assistance. Osage County Deputy Nathan Perling was the first person to arrive at the scene after he responded to the neighbor's call about the suspicious car on the street. On his way there, he was notified that there had been a shooting at the house. Holding his rifle, Deputy Perling hid behind a tree in the yard and looked inside the house, but didn't see anything suspicious. When he moved closer and looked through the window, he saw a woman covered in blood. The deputy contacted dispatch, telling them, quote, We need as much medical attention as we can get. Inside the house, Karen was lying in a pool of blood on the kitchen floor. She was still alive but had lost consciousness and was struggling to breathe. In the living room, 18-year-old Emily was lying dead. Just like her mother, she had been shot twice at close range. Sitting next to her was her great-grandmother Dorothy, who had remained conscious after being shot in the stomach. She was the person that Deputy Perling had seen when he looked through the window. The final victim, 16-year-old Lauren, was upstairs. 
She had also been shot twice, but was still alive. Both Lauren and Dorothy told the same story to first responders. The shooter had been James Kaler. Despite the quick response from law enforcement, there was no sign of James at the scene. After shooting Lauren, he had fled, leaving his wife and two of his children dead and dying. Later that night, both Karen and Lauren died in the hospital. Dorothy survived for longer, but passed away several days later. Within minutes of arriving at the house, police knew the identity of the shooter and launched a manhunt to locate him at any cost. There was no sign of him during that first night, but the following morning, he was located walking alone down a quiet road in the country. When he was approached by police, he went with them willingly despite having 27 rounds of ammunition with him. For the invasion of Dorothy's home and the murder of all but one of his family members, James Craig Kaler was charged with capital murder and aggravated burglary. In his early interrogations with police, James insisted that he couldn't remember much that had occurred over the past few weeks. All he could remember was that he had spent the previous night running through the woods alone. He stated that he was suffering from hallucinations and intense dreams about how his family had left him, and he believed that he was just crazy. At the same time, he went into detail about how his life had fallen apart, telling the officers that Karen had turned his family against him. He also said that, while he still had a good relationship with Sean, he believed that Sean would eventually take Karen's side and grow to resent him, becoming another messed up kid from a broken home. Despite insisting that he couldn't remember the shooting, investigators noticed that James seemed to be aware that his son had made it out alive. When a detective asked him whether he had deliberately spared Sean during the shooting, James replied, quote, I could have. The fact that he had managed to elude authorities for a night appeared to be a point of pride for James. He had somehow escaped a SWAT team, more than 150 police officers, a team of police dogs, and a search helicopter. During James's trial, his defense attorneys didn't attempt to argue that he was innocent. After all, two of the victims had survived long enough to share the identity of their killer. Instead, the defense argued that James was suffering from depression, which made him incapable of fulfilling the requirements of premeditation and intent that were needed for a capital murder charge. The prosecution told the jury it was clear that James had a plan. The attorney said, quote, In his mind, he had a problem to eliminate, and he knew how to do it. Meanwhile, the defense argued that Karen's lesbian affair had mentally broken James. The attorney held a pencil in front of the jury and then broke it in half. He asked the jury, quote, What happens when someone who's rigid is put under too much pressure? Then he answered the question himself, saying, quote, They snap. How dramatic. An experienced forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Steven Peterson, testified for the defense. Dr. Peterson told the jury that, when the crime occurred, James had been in a deep, depressive episode. In the psychiatrist's opinion, the severe depression had degraded James' ability to manage his own behavior, meaning that he was literally unable to stop himself from carrying out the crime. However, the defense counsel never directly asked Dr. Peterson whether James was capable of intentionally committing premeditated murder. Dr. Peterson's report noted that, in the year prior to the shootings, James had been, quote, faced with an affair between his wife and a lesbian lover, petitioned for divorce, arrested for spousal abuse, lost his employment with the city of Columbia, Missouri, lost contact with his family, and suffered serious financial setbacks. The doctor also wrote that James, quote, had no known history of drug abuse, psychiatric treatment, or criminal history, and that before the incidents that Dr. Peterson referred to as strife with his wife, James Kaler had, quote, an outstanding community reputation describing his life as perfect with a wife and three children. During his assessment of James, the psychiatrist came to the conclusion that he had responses that indicated deep chronic feelings of hostility towards family members, which resulted in outbursts of rage. He identified multiple key stressors that had likely contributed to the escalation of anger and the murders of James's family, including his resentment of Karen's relationship with Sonny, the termination of his employment, and his negative assessment of his daughters. He also believed that James's actions and personality were consistent with an obsessive-compulsive personality disorder. 
Dr. Peterson believed that James's hatred and lack of empathy towards Karen, Dorothy, and his two daughters were a symptom of how severe his depressive disorder was, as well as the deterioration of his obsessive-compulsive narcissistic personality. The doctor did acknowledge that there was one thing suggesting that James hadn't acted completely impulsively. He had made the conscious decision not to shoot Sean, instead moving on to kill the members of his family who he held the strongest resentment for. In response to Dr. Peterson's testimony, another forensic psychiatrist, Dr. William Logan, testified for the state. Unlike the other psychiatrist, Dr. Logan specifically stated that, regardless of whether James had been depressed at the time he committed the murders, he had been fully capable of premeditation and intent. On the day the shootings took place, James had driven more than an hour from Meriden to Burlingame, heading directly to Dorothy's house, where he had known a family gathering was taking place. His arrival at the house hadn't been a random occurrence. He had obviously planned it out, knowing who would be there that evening. Dr. Logan told the court, quote, He did not park in front of the house. He did not knock on the door. There was one person in the house that was spared. That was his son, Sean, the one whom he'd had the closest relationship. He apparently had spent some time outside the house watching before he decided to enter. He left, did not linger, did not call 911 or attempt to render any aid to the victims who had been shot. To Dr. Logan, the evidence within the house also suggested that the shooting hadn't been an impulsive, spontaneous act. The bodies were found in different rooms of the house, meaning that James hadn't been able to quickly shoot them all at once. After shooting Karen in the kitchen, he had gone from room to room, methodically hunting down and killing the rest of his targets. There were also no bullets found in the house. James, who was familiar with firearms and regularly went hunting, hadn't missed a single shot. When the state asked Dr. Logan for his opinion on that information, he said, quote, There are no random shots. In other words, this wasn't somebody who came in firing wildly and you've got bullets in random locations like in the wall or furniture or anything like that. Each bullet hit its intended target. The psychiatrist's report ended with the statement, quote, Mr. Kaler continues to see himself as the victim and that he was driven to commit the homicides. In his view, the homicides have justification because of the wrongs done to him. Sonny Reese agreed to testify at the trial. She argued against the allegations that her relationship with Karen had been a non-consensual affair. Instead, she told the court that she and Karen had been upfront with James about their relationship and that he had even given both of them a bunch of roses on one occasion. Defense attorney Thomas Haney commented on an email that Sonny had sent Karen before the divorce, which contained instructions on how to divorce a narcissist. Even though James had consented to the relationship between the two women, Sonny didn't believe that he was a good partner for Karen. She described Karen and James's marriage as being very abusive and said that she thought that she'd be able to protect Karen from James. At the end of the trial, the jury reached their verdict. James Craig Kaler was found guilty of capital murder. Because of the aggravating circumstances surrounding the crime, he was eligible for the death penalty. The aggravating circumstances included that there was more than one victim who had been murdered and that all of them had been killed in a way that was heinous, atrocious, or cruel. Amy Hanley, the assistant attorney general, told the jury that the four victims had, quote, died with an awareness that gave them the torture of slow death. None of the wounds had been immediately fatal, and James hadn't tried to provide medical aid or call an ambulance for his dying family members. Instead, he had run away while his wife, daughters, and great-grandmother-in-law slowly bled to death. Before the jury decided whether James should receive the death penalty, they were read two notes written by Sean Kaler. The first note read, quote, I do not want my dad to receive the death penalty because it would be hard on my grandparents. The second note simply stated, quote, I do not want my whole family gone. After the notes were read, James's attorney addressed the jurors, asking them if they had mercy for Sean. The attorney also insisted that, in James's case, a life sentence would be crueler punishment than execution, because he wouldn't be able to indulge in his hobbies of spending time outdoors hunting and fishing. Meanwhile, the prosecution asked the jury to imagine the pain and horror that James's victims had felt in the last moments of their life. 
They played a recording that had been captured on Dorothy's life alert monitoring system where Lauren could be heard screaming in terror about how someone was going to kill her. In another part of the recording, after Lauren had been fatally shot, she could be heard telling a deputy, quote, I don't want to die. The deputy tried to comfort Lauren even while she told him that her own father had been the shooter. After deliberating for less than an hour, the jury decided that James Kaler was to be sentenced to death. Kaler showed no emotion today as he heard his fate. The execution sentence comes as retribution for the shooting deaths of four family members. The court at this time sentences the defendant uh, for the crime of capital murder to death. James Craig Kaler opted not to speak on his own behalf and even asked if he could leave the room to avoid hearing the victim impact statements. Chief Judge Philip Fromm ordered him to stay. I loved Grandma White, Karen, <laughs> Emily and Lauren very much. I will miss them until the end of my days. Lynn Denton spoke of her grandmother, her two nieces, and her sister. The four women brutally murdered two years ago in Burlingame, Kansas. I still want to pick up the phone and call her. <laughs> when the phone rings, <laughs> I want to hear her cheery voice say, Hi, sister. A jury recommended the death penalty for Kaler last month, but Judge Fromm had the final say. He also denied Kaler's motion for a new trial. James showed no emotional response to the verdict, and neither did his parents, who were sitting in the row behind him. When he was escorted out of the courtroom, James landed one more cruel blow to Karen's family. Speaking to his own parents, he told them, quote, Take care of Sean so he's not raised by a bunch of freaks. That proved that the jury had definitely made the right decision. Lynn Denton, Karen's sister, gave a statement about the verdict. She said, quote, for the past year and a half, we've had a dark cloud around us that we associated with this trial. Now that it's over, the cloud is still there. The cloud wasn't about the trial. It is about our loss. The verdict and sentence doesn't bring our family back. James's sentence was upheld in 2018 by the Kansas Supreme Court and again in 2020 by the U.S. Supreme Court. In January of 2023, James's attorney filed a civil suit claiming that juror misconduct had occurred during his trial. That suit is still ongoing, but like most of his other efforts, it's unlikely that it will end in James's favor. At James's original trial, a statement from Dorothy White's daughter Patricia was read to the jury. She said, quote, I lost three generations of loved ones in one fell swoop. To this day, I still replay that frightening night over and over in my mind, just like watching an old movie reel. I try so hard to rewrite the ending, but there's no such option. Some people might hear this story and think that James was treated unfairly by Karen, and if that were true, it still wouldn't justify her execution along with her grandmother and daughters. What we have to take into account is that the details of James and Karen's private life are only being told from the perspective of James because, well, Karen can't tell her side. James ended her life. Karen's behavior as told by James needs to be taken with a grain of salt because James's perspective of the situation was so skewed by anger that he was willing to murder his wife and his own children over it. In my opinion, when someone starts believing that everyone is working against them, they're usually to blame for everything that leads up to them becoming a monster. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.